Good morning. My name is Bill Medina from Gallery Church, Patterson Park, and I give you welcome to the teaching of today, September 13, 2020. Before we read the word, I want us to take a moment and ponder about the events that happened 19 years ago when the way that we used to live changed forever. I pray that we can find peace in our hearts and we can help others to find peace as we trust that evil will not prevail. This is not about the country, this is not about people, this is about hatred, this is about lies and confusion. But I pray that the lies that we have heard and the lies that others have heard and have maybe led us into um, times of battle and times of doing wrong to others could be taken away. We give you thanks for the people that gave their lives to help others. And uh, we give you thanks for the courage. We pray for the families and we pray for the survivors. Uh, Father, I pray that we as a nation can surround them with love and help them to heal. And uh, that we can search for the peace that can only come from you, the everlasting peace. In the middle of the storm, in the middle of the war, in the middle of the trials, that we can find that peace and that trust that you are with us. In Jesus, I pray. Amen. So before we begin, I want to read from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, which is the scripture for today. So join with me in, in the reading of the scripture. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may, may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear any fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By these my Father is glorified, that you may that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I, I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I choose you, and appointed you, that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. If the world hates you, Know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, 
but I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said. The word that I said to you: a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse of their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If he had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have sinned and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in the law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from my Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witnesses about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. Father, thank you for your word. And thank you for the reliance on your spirit. We trust that your spirit will guide us not only in speaking with wisdom, but also in preparing our hearts so that we can be changed and transformed more in the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name I pray. Amen. Now, just as a recap of what we have been going through, we look at the transition from chapter 12 into the following chapters. Jesus is moving from affirming his credentials as the Son of God, and he established this body of believers that is called the church. And it is very important that we see the church as an extension of what Jesus is a ministry on earth. He prepared the church to continue with the mission and the statements that he um, prepared. And we can read that from the book of Acts when Luke is telling Theophilus about the things that the Spirit will be doing through the church uh, once Jesus ascended into heaven. Now, Jesus declared the principles that define his church. Um, it's a specific group of believers that follow Jesus direction he establishes a purpose for the church and then from now on he's going to be praying for the church so we can remember that the church is founded on love conviction and example uh, the church of jesus christ has been founded on love and it's a speci special kind of love it is not the love as the world knows how to love and in the Gospel of John and the letters of John, every time that he's talking, he's talking about this special love that it's not cannot be understood in terms of the world, but can only be understood in terms of the Spirit. And we can do that if we have the conviction, if we really believe, if we are truly convinced that everything that Jesus taught is real and that he is really who he said he was. But Jesus didn't only say that, he did it and he guided us through the example. And in the same way, uh, we are encouraged to do so that we can show with our acts and deeds and our thoughts um, that we are that we are truly followers of Jesus Christ. And we saw the four principles that Jesus established in the church, that it was service based in humility, not for their own benefit. That the church is a body that is God center. God is the center of the church, is not the community, is not the church, is not a person, uh, but it's God Himself who is the center of the church. Uh, the other principle is that the church is known because they love one another, and that's one of the marks, the dis distinctions of this group of believers, uh, saying that we love one another as God has loved us. And last week we saw that the church is being comforted by the Spirit. The strength of the church comes from the Spirit, which is goes in line with what we're going to be reading today about the church abiding in Him. 
remember that we end up chapter 14 last last week last Sunday when Jesus gets up and he says let's go so let's get out of here so Jesus is walking now towards the last hours on earth so before we begin um, I want to pray Father thank you for your love thank you for how much you have cared for us that you send your son so that he will offer his life as an ultimate sacrifice a redeeming sacrifice for your people Father, I pray that uh, the promise that he gave to us the promise that he made to us that he will send the Holy Spirit to live and reside in us and that he will show us the truth that it will be manifested today we know that the spirit is in us and we want to trust him fully trust in him so that he can speak words of wisdom but also that he can open our hearts so that we can understand and we our hearts can be changed and transformed for the glory of your name um, we pray amen so jesus has been talking about uh, different I am's and they are referenced by many scholars as the seven I am's in the Gospel of John and we were mentioning that there might be another one that is kind of hidden in the chap in chapter 8 verse 58 that Jesus claims is that he is the bread of life that he is the light of the world that he is the door he is the good shepherd he says I am the resurrection and life he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And today he's going to make this statement, and which is the last statement that we can find in the book of John, that is, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. So this one is a combined I am, because it's not only about him, but it's about the father himself as well. And the last one that I was mentioning is the one that we saw in the chapter 8 of the of Gospel of John, when he's plainly said I am so we have dreams and goals when I came to the US I had dream that one day I would have a big house with a big yard around and a pool and I also wanted to have a refrigerator filled with ice cream at least most of the times when I was living in Colombia I couldn't believe that it was possible that somebody could have ice cream in the refrigerators like having buckets of ice cream and when they were feeling sad they would just take it out and start eating directly from it i saw that in the movies and i thought that it was just a makeup for for the movie itself but then when i came here i don't have a big house with a big jar around it i do have the park nearby I don't have a pool other than the Patterson Park pool but I do have ice cream in my refrigerator and sometimes I, I eat from the bucket without my family knowing that I do that we have dreams and goals and they set us a path and a milestone in our lives when we go to school when we move into a city when we take a new job or even when we cast a vote for governor, major, or president, or presidential elections, we have dreams and goals. And those dreams and goals, they are written as milestones, the steps along the process that help us to remember what the original goal was and help us to measure the process of the progress that we are moving forward to that goal. Honestly speaking, I think that we're good setting goals in all the aspects of our lives but I think that many times we fail to have goals in our Christian life we have promised to read the Bible in one year and now during the pandemic we would have been able to read the Bible at least four or five times from cover to cover we some of us we have financial goals some of us we have professional goals and they help us to be motivated and to measure the progress what would happen if we would, if we had 
Christian goals in our lives. Now, God made promises. He made promises so that we can keep track of how we are walking in His, in the confidence, in the faithfulness of His love. And we can remember that He has been faithful all along our lives. He has established signs for the people to know who He was and the promises that He had made. But these signs may have been forgotten or they may have lost their meanings. Like many manifestations Jesus that Jesus was making, all the claims that he said that he was the outcome, the real manifestation of all the signs, when he said that he was the bread of God that descended from heaven, when he said that he was the living water, when he said that he was the light of the world, and he was in the middle of the uh, traditions that the people of Israel were celebrating, when they were celebrating uh, the pouring of water from the pool uh, of, of Shalom, when they were lighting the candles in uh, the temple during the Passover, and Jesus is standing up and he's saying, I am, I am the real manifestation of all these signs. And today he's going to make this big manifestation, this big emphasis in that he is the true wine and his father is the vine dresser, as we will see in a couple of moments. Now, I would like you to uh, look at the maps that we have used for Easter at some point in the, during this week and try to follow the path of Jesus as he was walking from the upper room into the Garden of Gethsemane. For many years, the Passover meant the sacrifice. Um, it was a celebration of God's deliverance of the people of Israel from Egypt. And they surrounded, uh, they focused themselves so much about the meal and the order in which the meal should be done and what could be eaten, what couldn't be eaten. And I think that at some point they, we lost the meaning of the celebration because we focus so much on the preparation. The people remember the signs as a far distance that they happened to someone else but not to themselves, and sometimes they became myths, wonderful, amazing events that happened to others. They had become so dull that they couldn't see the real expression of the signs. Even when Jesus came and he did all the signs and wonders, remember that John doesn't speak about miracles, but he speaks on signs that Jesus did. Even when Jesus did all of that, people was not ready and they were not sensitive to see him as the um, real manifestation of all these signs. Now, as Jesus is, there are principles that Jesus is talking about abiding in him. And, and most of it, if you look at the first verses on this, the scripture for today, you see that Jesus is constantly speaking and saying, uh, abide in me, abide in me. And abide is a very interesting word. Some other translations, they say you remain, stay in my commandments. But abide means that we are living and we are taking all our existence and energy and reason to live from him, from that person. Abiding uh, basically is bringing as a consequence two things, to let go things that are no longer in our of use in our new life and also seeking for the things that are good in our life. Last week I was mentioning to you that we move into the city because we heard God's call and when we moved here to this place there were some pieces of furniture that we couldn't just make it fit in our house. My brother, he just moved a couple of weeks ago. He was downsizing and he thought that he could fit some of the furniture in his apartment, his new apartment, and he couldn't. For example, the table, the dining table was so big that he couldn't fit it there. And if he had put it there, there would be no space left for him to move around the house. So he had to let all these pieces, all these big pieces, um, left them behind. As he was sharing with me, he said that, 
Around that table, there was so many good conversations and celebrations. And he just had to let, let them go. Keep the memories, but he had to let the table go. I think that in our lives, there are things that we need to let go in order for us to grow. There are so many things that we still want to fit into this new life. There are so many things that we would like to take with us to the big mansion that Jesus is preparing for us. And they may not fit because they were not meant to for that space. Jesus is telling his disciples that the word that is spoken to them is the filter. So Jesus left the word as the one that marks the milestones in our lives, like the steps, like the progress. So as we read the word, we can find that identifier of how our process growing in our new life is like. One of the things that he promised us um, after Jesus said that he was going to leave his disciples is that whatever we ask, we will be granted. Because now the way that we are asking is different than the way that we used to ask before. Now we know what is to ask according to God's purpose and not our purpose. Other thing about abiding is that we look for the Father to be glorified. When we bear fruit and we, when, when we bear much fruit, we prove to be his disciples and we bring glory to the Father, not to ourselves, but to God himself. Another thing that we find when we abide in him is that we know that Jesus loves us as the Father has loved him. So we, we learn from our parents and we teach our children about this new love, this new way of loving that is so different from what we used to know. If we abide in his love, Jesus says, we learn how to truly, truly love God because we learn how to keep his commandments and, and we can abide in his love. Just as he the, guided us with the example, he followed the Father's commandment and he abided in his love. Now, all of these things Jesus is telling us because there is another point. We're not looking for our joy, our personal, individual, selfish joy to be manifested but we're looking for that, the joy of Jesus to be planted in our hearts. And that joy, according to Jesus, will be made full when we abide in him. And that joy is different. You see, Jesus is going to die on the cross. He's going to go through uh, excruciating pain, insults, betrayal. And that is all above of happiness. I mean, he is above happiness. He's above um, making him feel better. He is in um, feeling the joy that is that he wants to have for us. Jesus mentions that there are two consequences when we abide in his love and there is one reward. So I want to I want us to look and understand these words. Love and hatred are the consequences of abiding in him and receiving the spirit is the reward of abiding in him love jesus reminds the disciples love one another as i have loved you and it's like i was saying it's a different way of loving it's loving with the agape love not the love that the world teaches us he's laying down his life for his friends and we talk a little bit about it Laying down the life for someone doesn't only mean to take a shot that is going directly to someone. It means to surrender my desires, my wants, and my wishes for the sake and the benefit of others. I said an example when we move into the city. I, I, we could be living in the dream house. We could be having um, the dream pool, but we chose to be here because we knew that God was calling us into the city. He has filled our hearts with joy. Yes, there have been times of pain and suffering, 
but he has filled our lives with joy being here in the city. Again, I know that many of you have done the same. Another thing about love is how we became friends of, of Jesus. We have that strength to do what he commands us. It is not that we do so that we can be loved. It's because we have been loved that we can do and follow his commandments. We're not longer servants. We, through love, we know that we didn't choose him, but he was the one that chose us. From the beginning of the, of the time, he chose you and me to be with him. And we know, as we were mentioning before, that whatever we ask the Father in Jesus' name, according to his name, he will give it to us. He is giving in that commandment, love with that kind of love, love to one another. But sadly, it brings, sadly and joyfully, it brings hatred. We are being hated by the world. Because the world, and we have to understand what the image of world is. It's not what we do outside the church because our lives now have been sanctified and everything that we do, we do it for the glory of God. Either if it's working, and we mentioned that, even if it's cooking, even if it's working on plants or laying some bricks or drywall or doing some landscape, everything that we do now is uh, done to bring honor to the Father. But the world is that system that goes against God, that tells us that everything is, that there are things that we're, what we can do or that are not to honor God. There is a one question at the end about what evil means in our lives. Um, what, does, what do we understand by evil? It can be a hard and offensive word. If we tell someone that that person is evil, that person may likely be really mad at us and probably will not talk to us, talk back to us. But what about if I say that someone or something is not, is done without being focused on God? And uh, we can find that if it's not God-centered or God-focused, then it could be evil. Jesus says, you're not of the world. I chose you out of the world. Because, and he says, therefore the world hates you. And it's because we do things with a different purpose, with a different reason. We do things with a different um, desire and understanding. We do things to honor God. And that's the purpose for us. And that's something that the system outside, remember the prince of the world is Satan. And he, doesn't, he wants all the praises to be given to him. Our own self. We like to receive praises to our name. And we know that everything that gets in between giving praises and honor to the Father, it's evil. Jesus is always telling us that we can be assured that we are His because if they persecute us, they will, they have persecuted Him. So at the end, being persecuted for His name's sake, is a sign that we are his. If we keep the, if they would, there is a chance for everybody. Everybody can believe or keep their word, Jesus' word. And if they keep Jesus' word, they will know that we are, that they are his and as well as we are his. The word doesn't take account. He doesn't give any um, honor to God's name or to Jesus' name. And sometimes we see and we hear people saying, oh, praise God that I got this, praise God that I did that. And all of this sometimes is more, it's only um, a tradition of saying things, but they are not really a belief in their hearts. And there is something bigger. It says, whoever hates me hates my father also because they hated Jesus without a cause. He was sinless. He didn't have any any anything that anybody would be could do against him uh, because Jesus had harmed them. They did it they hate him because they didn't follow. They didn't agree with what he was teaching. So abiding in him it brings us love within the church, but it also brings hatred by the world. 
the system world and I'm not talking about the world as a uh, astronomic body or the world as people outside the church I'm talking about the world as the human or the fleshly desires of this era but then it brings a promise the promise and it's a reward that it's the spirit that abides in us we abide in Jesus but the spirit abides in us and Jesus says when when the spirit when the helper comes and it's the promise that he will send it to the father that's why Jesus had to go to the father to send the spirit and he calls him the spirit of truth and there is a whole profound meaning about what truth is remember Pontius Pilate standing in front of Jesus and asking him what is the truth and how many hours researchers have been investigating about finding the truth what is the truth about the virus what is the truth about uh, the political campaigns what is the truth about and how much assurance brings to our lives when we know the truth how many times we have spoken to a brother or a sister or somebody and we don't we're not sure what they are thinking or what they are meaning in the words wouldn't it be so better for us to know for fact and the truth of what is happening uh, and that spirit he proceeds from the father and proceeding it's another deep meaning it doesn't mean that it's and a creation of the father but it proceeding means that he has been uh, produced or he has been formed from the same essence as the father same as Jesus he was he is part of that same essence of God himself so the father the son and the Holy Spirit they are in the same essence of God now he will bear witnesses about me he will tell us who Jesus is but he will also empower us to be witnesses of him because he has been with him from the beginning just go back to Genesis when the earth was void and it was chaos and there was nothing the Spirit of God was hovering upon the, the void of the dead he was with the father and the son when they say let us create the human let us create man at our own image so we are being sealed and it's not only that we're we're inside Jesus but now the spirit is inside of us so we're totally immersed in God nature himself so that is leading to five six meditation questions that I would like you to ponder about this week these questions are what areas do you think that need to be pruned in your life what areas do you think need to be pruned in your life to be according uh, the gospel of John and to be according to Jesus teaching out of those areas that I see that uh, need to be pruned which ones I would gladly like to be taken away which ones I would gladly like to be taken away the next question is harder one which ones I would really be hesitant I wouldn't like to let them go I know that they need to go but I can but I feel bad I, I, I feel opposing with a strong resistance to let them go <clears throat> what brings to your heart when we speak these words evil and hate what do you feel in your heart when you hear the words evil and hate and what about when you compare them with the words godly and love lastly what do you think what what is in your heart when we talk about a worldly life and an abundant life what is a worldly life and what is an abundant life So let's close today in a prayer. Father, thank you for your word. 
Father, well, thank you for inviting us to abide in you because we know that there are so many good promises. Just abiding in the true vine, abiding in you, just knowing and being uh, assured that we will be planted in you and that we can bear fruit uh, because the Father is the one that is pruning us. We're facing challenges and we're facing so many situations in our lives and we suffer when we are being pruned. When the leaves that they wanted to keep, like Jonah wanted to keep, that tree giving him a glimpse, a little tiny shadow as he was waiting for the uh, manifestation or for, yeah, for the manifestation of the hate that he had for this city. Um, he was waiting to, for you to manifest wrath instead of love, but you manifested love for that city. And he complained when he lost that plant, that guard um, from the sun. Father, what areas are in our lives that we are so hesitant to lose? And Father, I pray that uh, when we feel the pain of losing one of these areas in our lives, that we can see the fruit that is going to produce in us, that we can see and bear more fruit. But we know that through hard times is when our hearts just grow stronger. Through hard times is when our faith and our character is tested. I pray that through this season of testing we can see um, and we can bear a, a sweet fruit for you to honor your name, to bring glory to your name. Father, may the peace of the Lord Christ that surpasses all understanding, be with us this week. And I can hear you saying, and also with you, Amen.